I am Dr. Manveer Bhatia. I am a neurologist and a sleep specialist currently working in neurology and sleep center for which I am the director at New Delhi, India. So I finished my neurology training at the Orony Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi in the year 93 and then following that I was in charge of what is called as the electrophysiology lab under which we have brain monitoring which is EEG and nerve muscle monitoring. For the EEG part we went a little deeper and started recording activities or the EEG for prolonged periods of time. It was 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 and up to one week because we were trying to understand epilepsy in those days. So during that stint I found that there were many things which were happening at night uh, which didn't fit into epilepsy but didn't know what they were. So there were patients coming in with these complaints because we were not sure so what to label them. If you don't know what to label them, you don't know how to treat them. And that's how my interest then came into sleep that I should understand it a little bit more and to see that what is it that all happens can happen in sleep. So if we were to put it very simply, uh, there are three or four let, major kinds of sleep disorders. One is can't sleep and that is insomnia, that is poor sleep. We have some further definitions of this before we call somebody an insomnia, but let us say that it is those with poor sleep. Then there is a second group of people who are very, very sleepy during the day and that is called as hypersomnia. And there are third group of disorders in which people have abnormal behavior in sleep. Uh, they may get up, sleep walking, talking, hitting or injuries, etc. and that is a parasomnia. So, Worldwide actually insomnia is the commonest disorder. We now know with studies all over the world, mostly studies have come from the western countries, not too many from our country. Um, but one third of the population at a given time has an issue with sleep. Out of this 10% would fit the criteria for insomnia. So that is where the insomnia problem is. Uh, sleep apnea or the other entity which we said is increased sleep that is snoring and sleepiness during the day. If we were to look at just the level numbers for obstructive sleep apnea that would be about say 15 to 20 percent in males and about 10 to 12 percent in women. But if you were to combine the these symptoms with the abnormals testing then we are left with about 4 percent in men and 2 percent in women. So thus the testing you can pick up much more but symptoms may be in a fewer people. Uh, the third entity is much less. Is it much less because people do not come forward or are they really a lower prevalence? So that usually runs at about 4 to 5 percent. So these are the three major types of disorders that one sees. The major challenges are um, diagnosis, uh, dissemination of information. I think patients or people do not even recognize that this is a problem. It is considered that uh, lots of myths and beliefs which are around this area, lots of self-help techniques which people are following. So by the time they decide to see a doctor, it is really late. So that is one challenge is for identifying a sleep problem. Second challenge is how to test the sleep problem. Uh, people find it easy that if you can go and get a blood test done, you can figure out your blood sugars, cholesterol, etc. We do not have very good simple markers to test this problem. So thus we have what is called as a full night study. When somebody hears about this mode of testing, it is not a very uh, appealing or an easy method to test. Once you have this mode of testing, the second issue is who is going to test this? We need uh, technically sound people, well trained people for testing. So that is the evaluation of the person. Third part comes the management or treatment. So there are major challenges in this. Um, we have lesser number of trained uh, physicians uh, in this country particularly. Um, so you need that much education to be able to handle all types of sleep disorders so we can help the patients accordingly. So I would say the challenges are in all aspects, identifying the problem, confirming the problem, 
managing the problem. Uh, so sleep is a very essential commodity and sleep is a very essential requirement. Like, you know, it's now called as a third pillar of health. Uh, why so? We know that we spend one third of our lifespan in sleep. So it must be having a purpose. But every age group has its own kinds of challenges. You know, we have um, small children, when their sleep is not adequate, the parents can get uh, disturbed, which will impact the parents' work culture, etc. Then we have the school children, if they do not get the adequate number of hours of sleep, it will affect, now we know, their scholastic performance, their behavior, so academics and mood changes. So that's a big chunk of problems which will come up if children do not sleep well. Teenagers have their own issues. Uh, they are what is called as chronically sleep deprived. Teenagers require 9 hours, but not world over I don't think teenagers are getting that much. So it adds to their, um, again, issues with their mood, lots of teenage problems which one says and their health issues. Uh, work culture, it becomes harder as people Every day we see that the working hours have extended. Um, people are working 10, 12, some consultants 14 hours. Add to this some travel times. So that leaves almost no time for any other activity which can take care of your health. So continuously people are having that issue. And then of course we have the elderly where uh, sleep becomes a very big problem. They have self-help techniques such as dependence on sleeping pills, which can cause falls, fractures, memory problems. So to become a specialist uh, in sleep medicine, um, there are now various options available in our country. People from different specialities can or are eligible to become specialists in sleep medicine. But unfortunately, in the undergraduate level, uh, there is still a big lacuna that sleep medicine is not considered or not given enough importance. Number of hours allotted to the subject is not adequate. So thus when students are coming out from the MBBS, they, uh, their sound uh, framework is not there to pick up or identify a sleep disorder. Though of course now we do have, like I said, more abilities or more institutions where further specializations can occur. But it should be introduced at the ground level, that is the MBBS level. So once somebody has been diagnosed or has a sleep issue, uh, like we mentioned, it should have, I mean, we should be first sure that what is the sleep condition and then offer the solution. So if we were to take it one by one, um, somebody who has insomnia, for instance, as that is poor sleep, unable to sleep, the, there are only two measures for treatment of insomnia. One is something called as cognitive behavioral therapy which is done either by trained psychologists or by trained personnel who can deliver this therapy. And second is the sedative hypnotics or the sleeping pills as they are commonly called. So we have to be very sure in which group this should be given. Also, we should identify the cause of insomnia and treat the cause and not the symptom. For the sleep apnea, we again have different options available to us. Once we are sure that this patient has a severe sleep apnea or moderate to severe sleep apnea, there are majorly two, three options. One is a device which is called, sim in simple words, it can be used like a air blower that it gives air under pressure. So the breathing passages which are kind of closed at night will open up. These devices are mostly being or all being manufactured out of the country. They are being imported in, so they are expensive. Um, so that's one way that which device to use, etc. is how the doctors can help you. Along with the devices, there are other things like behavioral suggestions again, lifestyle measures, importance about weight loss, smoking, alcohol, sleeping pills has to be reinforced. And we have other options such as some surgeries or some dental devices, which are again given by certain specialists. So the, uh, the latest advancements in overall sleep uh, for the sleep sol solutions, one are for the sleep apnea, we have something like a pacemaker like device. Uh, because the tongue is a major muscle which controls the upper airway and keeps it open and it's now thought that the tongue muscles are not adequately functioning at night. So if you can give pulses at frequent intervals, keep the tongue tonically active, it will not 
collapse and thus prevent sleep apnea. So that's one device. Uh, pharmacologically or the med in the medical world or the tablet world or pharmacy world, we have also certain uh, new developments. Uh, some of these are medicines for those who have excessive sleepiness, uh, particularly a condition called as narcolepsy in which there is a severe uncontrollable desire to sleep. It affects the education, affects the work uh, and this medicine is as of now not available in our country. It has been available in the West for a while but that's not come. Uh, we also have certain other newer things which are available for some other rarer kind of sleep disorders. But those I think we don't miss them much here, we are able to manage. Uh, and I think that would be, so we have some pacemakers and some pharma things that are coming up. I think the awareness about sleep issues has definitely increased. So I think in the next five years, we are going to be uh, or going to be faced with a much larger number of people with the sleep issues. So we have to be then ready to handle those people, all those who are going to surface with the sleep issues. So that's going to be one issue, uh, one concern. Second is then, so adequate training and adequate number of staff should be available. The other thing is um, the next few years, there, there are going to be major changes in the monitoring of sleep. Uh, you know, now we know that sleep, because it's become an essential feature, so people are <coughs> concerned about it. So, all the wearable devices, all the phone companies have all introduced a measurement of sleep. So, initially it was that, okay, you do for your health activity, it was just counting steps. But I have a lot of patients who are all walking in with a lot of apps. There I have now Fitbit devices, which yesterday somebody showed me the data. So I think the wearable or the digital technologies are going to start. What about for medical side? So we are hoping that there could be better methods to measure sleep rather than getting people in, putting all these sensors. Recently I saw one shirt, there are some etc. also which inbuilt sensors that you wear it and it will just record sleep. So I think the medical side would, it would be great if you could measure sleep in an easier manner. Treatment wise, um, so CPAP has been there now for almost, uh, since the almost 1980s. It has gone or undergone a lot of changes dramatically in the look, the design, the feel, the weight, um, but it is still a device which the acceptance is not uh, almost immediate. It has its own issues of compliance. So we are hoping that something else would come up which would be easier to use um, and people would feel more comfortable using this.